Hey everybody, welcome to Burrow Tech. In this episode, I'm gonna be talking about the game that I made in just seven hours. All right, so let's talk about the game that I made in seven hours. But before we do that, I wanna make sure that you like and subscribe. And if you really like this video, please share it. Also, to support the channel, we don't do a Patreon, so you can buy the game that I'm talking about below, or you can buy the courses that we are known for. And if you really like the channel, you can subscribe. We have monthly options, yearly options, and lifetime access options. The best way to support this channel is to buy the products below. Every dollar that we get from the money that you give us, we put into production. So as I've said before, I made a game in seven hours and I wanna show you all the tips and tricks that I've learned along the way to make a game really fast. Now, if you've been following me for many years, I've always said that you should try to get the most enjoyable game out there for the least amount of time and money. By doing this, you will maximize your productivity and your time. Because game development and software development is inherently difficult and you don't want to waste your time on useless tasks. So since I've been building games for many, many years, even I had some pitfalls in this project. In fact, I thought this game would take maybe four or five hours to make, but it took seven hours. Now, one thing I wanna let you know is that this seven hours wasn't done in one day. It was done over a series of days. The reason is, is that I have a lot of other tasks running a company and I only have a little bit of time. This is great news for you because even if you spend 30 minutes to an hour a day, that time adds up. In theory, if you just spent an hour a day for seven days, then you can do the same thing that I have. In fact, you could probably do a better job because I'm about to tell you what went right and what went wrong. So first things first, I needed to find a game that people would enjoy to play and that would be easy to produce. Now, obviously I can't make a game like Fortnite or Overwatch in seven hours, but I can make something simple and casual for the mobile market. This is arguably where you wanna start if you're a beginner. Making a simple casual game will make you learn everything you need to know about game design, programming, and product management. Making a big scope game will not be good for your first project. You want to start really small. In fact, you want to start really small and then go down a few notches and start there. Game development is inherently difficult, so you want to pick a small scope project to get used to being able to publish a project. So let's take a look at some of the gameplay. This game is a handcrafted level that is very difficult to traverse. So this game is really, really hard and it's supposed to target the people that like really hard games. As a result, this game was actually relatively simple. There are pits, there are spikes, and if you run into a wall, you die anyway. Now, just because it's simple doesn't mean it's bad. I needed to figure out something that could be done in seven hours. And again, I actually thought it would take a little less time. So even though this game looks simple, it can be deceptively difficult. The biggest thing that took the most amount of time was actually the level design and and the level design took a lot more time than I thought it would. When you make a handcrafted level, make sure that you have a lot of time set to go and make the level and test the level. Because when you make the level, it takes a lot of time. And when you test that level, it takes even more time. So this is just a one level game, but at the same time, it is rather difficult to produce. So if you've been taking my courses for years, you know I like to start off with a game that doesn't really look good and to make sure that everything within that game is working. So I started out with basic shapes and frankly, a game that didn't really look good. Now, lots of times people will do this and I recommend that you do it this way. You want to make sure that your game is fun before you add in any art. Now over the years I've always subscribed to the code, do the art, and then completely finish the game. But as I've grown and as I've made more games, this is a iterative process. So you want to maybe code, do some art, see if the art leads to any new gameplay ideas, and then do that process over and over again. Now, if you're making a bigger game, I would recommend doing it this way. However, if this is your first game, then I would recommend just picking a concept and trying to get that out the door. In fact, oftentimes you want to subtract from your game to get it out the door. This is incredibly contrary to what a lot of people will tell you, but I can tell you that over the years that if you make a lot of very simple games, you'll actually be a better game developer than if you make one really huge game. So I like to call this subtractive production. So let's say you have a game and it has, let's say 10 features here, and you'll find out that maybe two of the 10 features are really, really hard to make. What should you do at that point? Should you spend a lot of time to get those two features out 
or should you cut it and make your game simpler and smaller scope? Now, I personally like to cut out those items and get the game out there because again, people will not like my game if it's sitting on my hard drive. I've had so many games where I've tried to get those two items out there and to finish the game to my original specifications only to have it not be released for one reason or another. So in the end, it's not about how many features your game has, it's whether or not the game is gonna be fun to play. So a lot of the beginning work ended up being making sure the jump arcs were just right, the gravity was just right, and making sure that the game played. And I wanted to make sure that the game played on multiple devices. Now, I haven't mentioned it, but I am using Construct 3, which is my favorite game engine to use to make this game. So with Construct 3, there's this really easy option where you can mobile preview, where it literally gives you a QR code and you can test it on your iPhone, your iPad, or whatever device you want. Now, I did this, and you always want to test it on all devices before you add anything else, because you have to get that right. If it doesn't work on all devices immediately, then it's going to be a bigger problem later down the road. The reason is, is as you add more content, you might have to do more work to get it to play on all devices. It simply isn't just clicking a button and exporting it. There's work that needs to be done. And this goes for every kind of game engine and not just Construct 3. Luckily, Construct 3 is the fastest and my favorite, so that's why I use it. So once I made the levels and I got all the functionality and most of the technical aspects out of the way, I wanted to pick a color scheme and do the art. Now, when it came to picking an aesthetic, I wanted to pick something that was easy to do and look good. And I actually picked up something that was really interesting in this game. So this is the biggest tip I have for you. If you are consistent in your aesthetic or if you do something that's opposite and you do it purposefully, it will be a major success. Oftentimes when I see beginners pick their aesthetic or they make their art, the art and the aesthetic tends to clash. So I'm gonna go over the aesthetic choices that I made with the art and I'm also gonna tell you why it was easy to make. So let's take a look at the character. Now character animation can be really difficult. So what I decided to do was pick an eight by eight aesthetic. If you don't know, when you make pixel art, you usually make characters within a certain kind of canvas size. So there are eight by eight characters, there are 16 by 16 characters, 32 and 64. Now this heralds back to the days when you can only use these kind of palettes to get your game to actually work on the consoles itself. This is of course due to limited resources. So picking an 8x8 aesthetic works out really well, and I recommend doing the 8x8 aesthetic. Now, when it comes to modern games, this game is actually not a retro game where it has something like 256 characters by 256 characters. For example, the Nintendo, that's what the screen size was. So this game is an HD game, but it happens to have an old aesthetic. So what I did is I went into Construct's pixel editor, I made the art, and then I scaled it up. And this was a really good thing to do. Now, when it comes to those specific canvases that I talked about before, for example, the 8x8 or the 16x16, what I like to do is that is the general template. And if you have to move outside of it, for example, the helmet horns are too big, or there's a cape, or there's a spear or something that needs to have something else or a bigger canvas, then you're more than allowed to do it. Remember, you don't have the restrictions of the past and you shouldn't necessarily adhere to those restrictions. In fact, games that do this, like Shovel Knight, pay homage to this aesthetic and they don't actually follow it strictly. And this is something that you wanna do as well. So once I got the character, I had to animate it. Now, animating a character can be really, really complicated, but I decided to make it fairly simple. Now, the animations, I think, look very good, and they weren't that hard to do. In fact, I did have to maybe discard a few animations that looked terrible. The hardest part for me in this game was getting the arms to work. Now, I decided to have this character hold a sword, and the reason I did that was to make sure that he was running to something. If you don't want to animate the mouth, put the character in a helmet and you don't have to do that animation. It's a cheap trick and if you know a game that has done this, please post it in the comments down below. I'll be interested to see what those games are. Now let's take a look at some of the foreground game objects, such as the blocks and the spikes. Now since this game is an 8x8 aesthetic, mostly, I decided to make the blocks 8x8 as well. So I picked this block and it's a very nice looking block and it works out really well. Now I also needed to, at this time, make sure that the scrolling speed wasn't too fast because if it's too fast, it would be a little bit disorienting to the player. So I went through several prototypes of the block and this block that I chose was the best one that didn't disorient the player. I also made a spike into that 8x8 aesthetic and it looked pretty good. 
So at this point in time, I had to pick a color scheme. Now this game is a monochromatic game, meaning that it's basically just one color. Now I can make games with multiple colors and I've made games with all these different kinds of colors, but for this particular game, I decided to make it monochromatic and the color I picked was purple. I think it's a very good aesthetic and I think the game looks really nice. One of the things you have to understand about picking a color scheme is that you don't want to be too literal. You can take a look at some of the old NES games, especially the early ones, where they said, you know, metal has to be gray or it has to be black. And in future games, you'll see that the metal is purple or yellow. It's something that's a little bit different. So when it comes to picking a color scheme, you don't want to be super literal on it. Now, the monochromatic scheme is by far the easiest, and I thought this complemented the easiness and the simplicity of the 8x8 aesthetic that I used in the character. Now, when it comes to picking aesthetics and when it comes to making a game, everything has to be organic. So the complement of the simple color scheme to the simple art does make a difference. If I made the color scheme really complicated, it wouldn't be as good. So this gets into my next point. One of the biggest things that you need to understand in game development and pretty much all development is the word juxtaposition, and that is comparing one object to another side by side. So since we're comparing different objects, for example, we have the character and we have the foreground, I wanted to juxtapose that with something different in the background. Now I had experimented with a pixel art background, but it didn't look as good. So I said to myself, why don't I just make a vector background and see what happens? And if you're making a game, you have to try things or else progress won't be made. Now making backgrounds is actually pretty easy. You can have hills and then maybe even bigger hills than mountains in the background and you can even have mountains behind that. So you can have as many different layers as you want. Now the big tip that I have here is that the closer the hills or the object, the more dark it needs to be. So the hills in the foreground have to be darker than the hills in the background. And if you go to a mountain region, you can see this for yourself. So when it comes to this game, I actually picked an archetype in the gaming world. Now gaming is old enough to have these archetypes. So what I did is I put a castle in the background and this is an homage to Castlevania game. In fact, Shovel Knight does the exact same thing where they put a castle in the background. The famous end credits to Castlevania have this and I decided to put it in my game. Not only that, there is just a little bit of narrative. There is a knight running, perhaps he's running to that castle in the background, which is exactly what the narrative in these other games are doing as well. So at this point, I had a game pretty much ready to go, but there was a lot more that needed to be done. For instance, we needed to make a uh, heads up display and we also needed to add the pause mechanics. So what I did is I actually made the GUI mechanics to be a completely different color. In fact, they're white so that they pop out. And I picked the text and I picked this really cool font uh, and I made the font purple to adhere to that monochrome aesthetic. I think the juxtaposition of the gray buttons against the background stands out really well. Remember, you can make your own rules, but sometimes if you break the rules in just the right way in your own aesthetic, it actually works out really well. So adding the pause mechanic was actually really simple until I got to the sound, which was actually something I got hung up. So let's talk about the music. So I've been using FL Studio since 1999 and I absolutely love the program. So what I decided to do was make an upbeat track that worked with this game. Now, again, sometimes you don't have to put in the right type of music with the game. So I could have made a very symphonic sound soundtrack that's similar to what you would hear in the medieval era, or I could even just take some medieval music and put it in the game. I don't think that would be a good idea. There are lots of times if you pick a different aesthetic of music, it makes the experience a lot better. The best example of this would be Guardians of the Galaxy. Putting 70s funk and pop music into a science fiction setting worked out surprisingly well. So I'm using that same concept in my game here by adding an upbeat electronic music to this game. Also, upbeat electronic music is very easy to compose, so I highly recommend that you do it too. Remember, I tried to make this game in as little time as possible so I wanted to pick all the tricks that would make it work. Symphonic music is really difficult to make and if you wanted to make music that was very similar to the medieval era that would probably even take a little bit longer. The reason is, is that those musics are a lot harder to compose to begin with and electronic music is well relatively easy. But just because it's easy it doesn't mean it's bad. So whenever I make video game music, I always make the music with really, really hot synths. And what I mean by that is that the synths are really piercing and they really stand out. They are hot, they are uh, lead synths. And over the years, I've had a lot of people say that that kind of choice is annoying. So what I always do is I always bring it down and I always change the synths at the end to something that's a little less hot because the music in a video game has to be a part of the background, it can't be the main. So if you wanna make game music that sounds like club music, it doesn't necessarily work. 
So there are more things you have to do to make the music work better in the game. So now I've added the music to the game and getting the pause to work and getting the music to turn on and off, which is a feature that you always have to have in your game, was a little bit more challenging than I thought it would be. Even though I've done this a lot of times, it was just a little more challenging and I probably spent way too much time on this task. So now we're nearing the end of this game here and believe it or not, the polishing part is really hard. Now I probably spent maybe two or three hours just on polishing, moving things up, making sure everything's just right to get this game out there. And this polishing part is usually the hardest part of the game. Now that's why you want to pick a small scope game because if the game is really, really complicated, then this polishing is going to take a lot more time. Now I know this, but at this point in time, I had spent maybe about four hours and then the other three hours were just spent on polishing. I know it seems a little bit silly to do this, but if I didn't do this, then the game wouldn't be as good as it is. So now after all is said and done, I have to make an icon and then I uploaded it to the app store. I picked some images and I got my assistant to write a really awesome sales copy. So let's recap this video. So I made a game in seven hours and it took a little bit longer than I thought. So the polishing part took the longest time and I could only get this game out there in seven hours if the game was really simple. I thought this game was really well done and I made some really good decisions that both complemented the simple style of game and even to make this YouTube video. Remember that the best projects have everything working together. The code works with the art, and the art works with the marketing and everything just works so well to become a success. So that pretty much wraps up this video. Please buy my game down below because I don't do a Patreon, instead I sell products. And if you want today's featured course, which is how to make games in Construct 3, you can learn how to make games really quickly in Construct 3. There are a lot of other courses down below and remember that every single dollar that you put into the products down below, we put right back into production. Please be sure to like and subscribe and I'll see you in another video.